All right, folks, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jan Santerra. I'm the Urban and Community Forester for the Maine Forest Service. And I am going to uh, <clears throat> be doing the introductions here for, for this uh, quarterly update on EAB and other tree health concerns that we we tend to focus our um, information towards uh, municipal tree and forest managers and others that are managing um, public trees. So welcome, thank you. Um, for your interest in this topic and for signing up. We did have a fairly healthy registration with over 120 registered. Um, and I see now that we've got um, probably roughly half of that here in the meeting this morning. So uh, great turnout. Thanks for being here and taking some time away from uh, clearing, clearing that lovely snow that we uh, got overnight. Um, so just uh, some housekeeping uh, when you're coming in, please mute your lines. Um, we do try to manage that, but uh, if we somehow miss you, please try to uh, keep your line muted. Uh, you can use the chat function to ask questions um, <clears throat> and, and share information. This webinar will be recorded and we do intend to post it to the Main Forest Service YouTube channel and the Forest Health and Monitoring homepages. Um, if you need assistance, during the program. I see that uh, Allison and Amy have posted that in the chat, but you can please email forresthealth at maine.gov or call 207-287-2431 or text 207-949-5712. Uh, we are offering uh, licensed foresters credits, one and a half credits for this program and one pesticide credit. Uh, to get the pesticide credit, you do need to take the quiz um, with a passing score and evidence of attendance um, in order to receive that credit. Um, attendance will be checked against the roster provided by Microsoft Teams. So if you are seeking credit and can't be identified by your name um, that identifies you in Teams, you're just a, a telephone number or a, an, an identifiable email, you'll want to please reach out to forresthealth at maine.gov with your um, full name, or you can type it in the chat. Um, and for those of you that are eager to get back to that shoveling um, and won't be taking the quiz right away, that will be open until tomorrow night at midnight. Um, so we'll jump right into the agenda, uh, unless somebody else has anything to say. Um, our first presenter is Jeff Gillis. Jeff is a native of Maine, lives in Brunswick. He's a Maine licensed arborist, uh, as well as International Society of Arbor Arbor Culture Certified, uh, Tree Risk Assessment Certified. He's a Master Licensed Pesticide Holder and owner and president of Welltree Incorporated, which is a um, arbor culture and landscape company in Brunswick, which he started over 23 years ago. And Welltree specializes in, is in tree and shrub care for residential, municipal, and commercial properties. Jeff is gonna be talking about timing considerations for treatment of EAB. Um, and he has um, uh, joined us from the West Coast as he's uh, at a conference and um, is, is uh, giving us our time before he heads into a program himself to continue his learning. So thank you, Jeff, for joining us and taking your time. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Jan. Um, so I understand that there's some snow in some, some parts of Maine right now. Um, so sorry about that. Um, uh, so our our experience with treating for emerald ash borer is fairly recent, in in that you know in our particular area we haven't uh, um, you know the uh, known infestations haven't been within our uh, close to our our area. So the, Greater Greater Brunswick area, um, so we haven't we haven't been doing any treatments until uh, well, we started uh, last year, uh, and then this year we we found emerald ash borer in Brunswick, and uh, the the trees we found them on were, were fairly small in diameter. They were twelve inches in diameter and smaller, so um, we found. Uh, I believe it was uh, July when we found them. So um, 
we wanted to uh, take some action uh, that was appropriate uh, and um, and then also plan for for other treatments and and uh, the appropriate timing for that. So um, um, as as many of you may know, for some of the smaller diameter trees, say, you know, eight inches diameter, maybe 10 inches diameter and smaller. Um, you know, you can use a soil inject of say imidacloprid, um, but it doesn't have the longevity and the and uh, necessarily the toxicity to um, different stages uh, as say uh, a stem inject would with emamectin benzoate. But if if using a a soil inject injection, of course, there's a delay um, before there's good distribution within the canopy. Um, and then with with ash trees, uh, we also have the compounding factor that they're very late to leaf out in the spring. So, you know, with many other kinds of trees uh, that have their leaves out, it that helps with uh, transpiration of of water and distribution of product. So, um, so we're a little later in, in into the spring for that with ash, and then um, they're they're pretty quick to shut down in the fall too. So, um, even if they haven't lost their leaves completely, you'll see a um, you know them start uh, the the uh, color change perhaps. And so they're shutting down well before uh, many other tree species will. So it's a different uh, treatment window uh, based on that alone. And um, so in a in a perfect world, I would I would say that um, you know springtime is going to be your best best time, and hopefully there will be others that either agree or disagree later in this conversation. Um, but that's that's been our uh, sort of our understanding, and um, um, you know we we have been uh, doing some treatments that are uh, later in the in the season. And by later, I mean um, you know July August when we know that okay we have a we have a really significant infestation that's. Uh, you know, nearby, um, and you know, we're we're trying to get something started anyway. Um, it might not be optimal, but um, you know, uh, it's it's a way to at least get things started. So, um, you know, we have found that even with emamectin benzoate as a stem injection. Um, the pro what formulation of that product is used has made a big difference as far as distribution within the canopy. Uh, and um, you know, we've been using triage brand and um, there's a formulation called R10, which seems to distribute much more effectively than earlier uh, iterations of that product. And for some reason, we've also found that um, it is it is the the uptake is has been even better when uh, temperatures have been uh, fairly warm, like eighty degrees or more. And you know, with a lot of trees, you know, when you when you start getting into the eighty plus degree range. Um, you know, your transpiration is actually starting to slow down a little bit. And so it's been a little perplexing in that sense. But, um, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, if you can, if you can shoot for that, that, uh, that spring treatment, that's, that's going to be ideal. And, um, you know, I, I guess I didn't talk about bark drenches for smaller diameter trees, but that's another uh, another option um, instead of soil injects for a little faster uptake, say with dinotefuron. Um, so, 
Yeah, I, I thought I would that's sort of a, an overview of our experience. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions for me. Um, but I'd, I'd rather answer questions than just um, fill space. Understood. Yeah. Okay, we're getting an echo. I think that uh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if if anyone wants to type questions into the chat, they can go ahead and do that. Um, I think, well, where Jeff is on a, a um, has to bow out of the program. If you do have specific questions for Jeff and you want to unmute yourself, you can feel free to do so at this time um, before we we um, continue on in the agenda. Um, you can also raise your hand, use that function in Teams. I'm not seeing I'm not any specific, specific. Oh, no. OK, Tom, Tom Ford is is on the line and wants to ask a question. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Tom. How are you? Good. Hey. Good. I know you're a mad scientist with doing injections and all of that. So um, have you, uh, I guess, um, have you done, um, I know you mentioned many, a, a few materials that you've been using. Mm -hmm. um, what? I guess what I'm what we're seeing or following guidelines is, you know, 20 percent, maybe 30 percent if you're pushing the margin on decline in a tree. Yeah. Um, and I same thing with us is uh, G4. We've been trying to do that as soon as possible. We've done it later in the year, just trying to save whatever trees we can. Mm -hmm. um, in Portland, there's been a pretty big wave all the way from, you know, kind of Gorham right through Portland. There's a big corridor there. Um, are you, um, we're, <laughs> my, my colleagues in the office are going <laughs> to laugh at me um, for saying this, but um, have you found that, obviously, I think acephate is kind of a, a quick moving material. Mm -hmm. And have you have you used that or tried to? No, you know, that's a good question. Um, we have not. And, um, you know, I I could see where, you know, considering how quick it is, um, I could I could see how that might be effective, but uh, we don't have any firsthand experience um, with it. Uh, yeah. So, and you? No, I think I I think preventative is is obviously the key, but when you come into a tree that is in, you know, like I said, maybe a third decline, it's a question mark. Is like, what do you, you know, is it worth using G four or something like that? Yeah, yeah, and we're I guess we have we've had a, the luxury, I guess you could say, of being in an area where um, there hasn't been in it in any known infestations for a while so we've been able to communicate with our um you know customer base well in advance that here you know this is what we're waiting to see you know once once we receive any reports that it's within you know so many miles of of, of your location then we should start some preventative treatments so you know, even with that, as you say, there are, you know, either people we haven't met yet or, you know, people get distracted and what have you. And all of a sudden, oops, you know, there are some trees that maybe should have been treated a while ago. That happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah like jump, I said, we, we can I jump no, in for a second? Uh, yeah, I, I uh, so we uh, did some work with uh, G4. Uh, and uh, we were actually doing some bioassays, so we injected the tree, and then we collected leaves uh, that that next week, and the beetles were killed. Okay, so what happens is that material goes into the tree, goes up into the canopy, into the leaves, and by the following week, uh, the uh, the we didn't test the first week, but by the following week, the, it killed all the beetles that we put in the bioassay. Hmm. So uh, the stuff moves really fast. Uh, and, uh, you know, and one of the things that we've been finding is that 
you can keep whatever is alive alive on that tree. So like I've we've had trees which have been half dead, 60% of the canopy being, being missing, and the 40% of the tree will still be alive. So I think from the standpoint of managing these trees, you want to think of it in, in terms of what part of the tree is left and if that remaining tree could be a hazard. So, you know, you want to think of the structural soundness of what's there because the dead part will never come back and because it, it is has just a single layer of functional xylem around the bark. Uh, the trees just, you know, once once they etch that xylem, they dry out really fast and it's brittle as all get out. So, uh, so you know, uh, the, the MMectin benzoate product works really well. I know that uh, uh, acephate was labeled uh, early on and in some of the, the, the studies, the, if you can get a copy, uh, I'll, I'll probably put into the chat, uh, the insecticides for controlling emerald dash borer. They review some of the studies that are inside there. It does kill beetles, uh, but it's not nearly long lasting enough uh, to to do the job. And uh, so I think that's kind of uh, why. And I I don't know if there's any phytotoxicity issues with ash, but I know occasionally with the acephate you can have some leaf burn from time to time. So I mean, I'll I'll give you back the the mic, Jeff. Thanks, Cliff. Um, there was one more question in the chat, if we have another moment. Um, uh, and Dylan says, sorry if you've already covered this. Um, have you seen any effectiveness with basal bark treatments? No, with them, Roman. Uh, well, um, I guess in that case, it would be, say, using dinotefuron. We have not used that, and or I guess with imidacloprid as a basal bark. Um, but um, so I could I jump can, in. Yeah. <laughs> I could jump in. So I know, you know, uh, I've been dealing with emerald ash borer for almost 20 years in Indiana. So, I um, mean, you know, you guys are doing a great job <laughs> of being newbies on the block and this sort of a thing. So, uh, you know, was, Deb McCulloch had reported some studies a while back where on the thinner bark trees, pretty much, uh, you know, 10 to 15 inches, you know, just depending on the species of ash, uh, you can get really good translocation through the bark with the dinotefuran. Uh, there was a time when we were uh, mixing with some sort of wetting agent, some sort of silhouette type of wetting agent to get it go, going through there. And uh, it just did, it didn't matter. This wetting agent didn't really matter all, all that much. Uh, it actually killed the lichen around the base of the trees. So the trees almost looked like they were wearing white skirts, <laughs> you know, for, for a while. But uh, the thing is, is that uh, that works. It's really fast if you do the bark. The trunk trench. The, the trick of it is 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 the calibration. All right. So you want to make sure you're delivering the right amount of active ingredient per inch of diameter dBH in that in that trench. So what you would do is you would just basically time yourself to see how long it would take you to coat that tree uh, with a, a given nozzle size, a given pressure, and then you would calculate the determine the volume of product that was used to get that on a, uh, on a tree of a particular diameter. And then you'd have to make sure that you'd have uh, to be enough product inside that mix so that it would actually get inside there. So that's kind of you know, how, how you'd have to go about doing it. But yes, but the trunk, the, the trunk drenches work really well on small trees, especially if, if you're in a hurry, you know, you don't, you may not have had your crew trained up for the injections. Uh, I'm not a really big fan on injecting a, a four inch tree. You know, for that matter, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, or even an eight-inch tree. But on the larger trees, you know, uh, and, and then you can you can sort of keep things alive. I know in in Maine, trees grow a lot slower than they do in Indiana because your growing season's a little bit it's a little bit shorter. Uh, so uh, you know, it it may be it may be quite quite reasonable. I don't know when the last time you planted ash in Maine was, but I know we haven't been planting ash for twenty years. <laughs> so. Thank you. I, uh, Gordon, um, I got a quick question. Do you um, do you recommend a bark penetrant like a Pentra bark or something with that as well? So I think Cliff had already sort of mentioned that, that they used to recommend something like Pentrabark with the yeah, Dinotefuron, but they don't. Yeah, we used to use Pentrabark. That was, that, was that was the adjuvant that we would use. 
and uh, it, it, you don't really need to use it because it actually go, it goes through without it. Thank you. OK, um, I think that uh, that's the extent of the questions I'm seeing in the chat. Um, and I know Cliff also has a, a, a short time window here. So thank you so much, Jeff, for taking the time this morning uh, to you. join us and, and share your your knowledge um, and your experience. So um, thanks. Thanks from all of us. And we thank will you. chat with you soon. All right. Take care. You too. Yeah. And at this point, I think I'm going to hand it off to you, Allison. Of course you are. <laughs> so um, as you have noticed already, we're really lucky today to have Cliff Sadoff here joining us. Cliff has been with Purdue University for over 30 years. And as he mentioned, he has been working with Emerald Ash Borer for more than 20 years. So it really brings a lot of depth of knowledge to this presentation. Um, really happy to have him with us today. If you do a quick web search of Cliff Sadoff, then you'll see that he has quite a few tools that he's uh, worked with collaborators on to help uh, managers make better decisions about managing tree pests and diseases. Um, I will mention that he has also recently put up some, some videos on YouTube under the Purdue Tree Doctor. Um, I think we're going to have a link in the chat for that soon. Um, and also just invite you to, to share your questions and um, take a full advantage of Cliff joining us here today. Um, similar to Jeff's presentation, there'll be opportunity after Cliff's wrapped up his presentation in order to ask your questions. Um, so thanks again, Cliff, for joining us and for uh, helping us as we continue this journey with Emerald Ash Borer in our cities and towns. Thank you so much for inviting me, Allison. I really, really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, about having working with Emerald Ash Borer for so many years is that uh, I've seen ash, Emerald Ash Borer move through the state and my ability to save ash trees in Indiana has been somewhat limited due to the fact that a lot of the trees, uh, not all of them, but a lot of the trees have already died, uh, the ones that haven't been saved. So uh, being able to talk to you in, in Maine where you're just getting started uh, is something that, I, that I, I'm really happy happy to do because uh, I know that you can have a really big impact on the health of your of, of your trees. So um, I did put that uh, Purdue Plant Doctor uh, playlist in the chat over there uh, so you can look at the different types of uh, YouTubes. I uh, made them five minutes long because I have mercy on everybody who <laughs> who have to wants to get onto a YouTube video. I don't they don't like to hear me drone for too long. So anyway, uh, let's start uh, with, with today's talk is a uh, and the talk is science can save your ash tree from uh, emerald ash borer, double entendre intentional. OK, so. Um, can we go here? OK, so I'm going to start off with some take home points. Emerald ash borer is. Lethal to trees, OK, it can kill large ash trees, uh, small ash trees, and the large ash trees will take decades to replace. So once they're lost from the landscape, they're uh, they are indeed lost. Uh, the other take home point is that uh, emerald ash borer is one of those take no prisoners kind of a pest. All right. If you miss the boat, you know, if you uh, wait until the tree is half dead, that half dead part can't be saved. Uh, and uh, you're probably going to lose that whole tree because what's left of that tree is likely to be structurally imbalanced, unsound and the like. So early intervention is really important. Now, not too early. You want to wait until the emerald ash borer is in the region. But uh, once you start noticing it in your area, you know, it's really good to get a plan ahead of it. Uh, long term protection is indeed possible and economically valuable. I've done a number of economic analyses and I'm going to present a couple of uh, simplistic and maybe a little more complicated ones just to get the point across that those of you who are responsible for protecting urban forests really would want to consider keeping your ash trees alive. And then uh, injection of of emamectin benzoate once every three years, not every two, once every three years is sufficient to keep these trees alive. And that really uh, helps with the economics uh, uh, to, to keep to keep it going. And then uh, cost cutting measures like reducing the number of injection ports 
uh, will reduce the capacity of the product to diffuse evenly through the canopy, and that would reduce the effectiveness. So uh, uh, let's get started. I'll start off by, since I know you're relatively new to Emerald Ash Borer, by reviewing some of the symptoms. This is this tree, I would say, has lost about a third of its canopy. The whole top here seems to be to be gone. Uh, you know, so if you sort of make it you divide it like this, it might be about a third, maybe 40% of the canopy is lost on this tree. And it's pretty much on the on uh, the margin of whether you should treat it or not. You know, if you treat this tree, this whole top part will probably die, and then you're going to have to shape a tree out with what's left. So in many cases, this might be beyond the point of saving. Now, I took this video a couple of years ago to show you uh, what happens. This is a, an emerald ash borer. This is its ovipositor. It's sticking out of its abdomen, and it's hiding it in these cracks and crevices. You saw the ant early on in the video. Uh, it does that because ants will, you know, eat emerald ash borer eggs like protein candy. Uh, but 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 this is kind of how they how they lay their eggs, and the eggs are laid on there. Uh, and once the eggs hatch, they will drill directly into the canopy. Uh, so uh, it won't be uh, they won't be crawling on the bark. So you have to make sure that either the the, the trunk is coated or that there is insecticide into the uh, functional xylem uh, of of that of that uh, tree. Okay. So what are the signs and symptoms? Okay, some of the things we talk about are D-shaped exit holes, and here it, this is. It has uh, the beetles have a flat back and a round belly, and that's why they make this D-shaped exit hole. Uh, they have typical zigzag galleries. This is the the young larvae, and then as it molts, it gets bigger and bigger. It makes that zigzag. You'll also often notice a uh, bark splitting. This is kind of interesting. The way this works is that when trees grow, they lay on new bark, right, to keep them covered with bark every single year. And when you kill a portion of it. Uh, the other side of the tree is still growing and it's pulling it, it's just ripping the part the bark away. So it's kind of like you're spending a little too much time at the all you can eat buffet and you're starting to gap your buttons, that kind of a thing. That's kind of what's going on on the other on the dead side of of, of the trunk over here. So uh, so these are, are are the things you're going to see. You're going to see uh, thinning. You might see these extra sprouts which we call epicormic water sprout epicormic sprouts coming out of the the bottom of the tree which is essentially its last gasp um they they start attacking the top of the canopy and that's why you start seeing the thinning at the top of the tree you know they they are um visually oriented you know these beetles have big eyes and they also are uh, will orient chemically to the green leaf volatiles of the tree so that's why they land on the top of the tree following the scent and then they'll work their way down uh and here you see a nice gradation of of, of injury uh what i look for uh, a lot is the presence of woodpecker injury uh, especially in the winter time uh, you know, so sometime uh, in March, you know, uh, I know that in areas where we have a really big problem with emerald ash borer, the woodpecker activity is really, uh, really heavy. And you start noticing this blonding uh, on uh, where the uh, the woodpeckers have just pecked off uh, all, all all the exterior bark. And and woodpeckers are are pretty amazing. They can hear very well. I think they hear the chewing, and that and that that's kind of how they how they orient. And uh, you know, they're Woodpeckers are amazing creatures. They've got these barbed tongues, and once they stick their tongue inside that little peck, they can just pluck that borer right out. And here you see some of the holes left by the woodpeckers, and here you see some of the uh, bark that's been flecked right off. So uh, the next thing that happens is that we start seeing these, these uh, frass-filled zigzag galleries, and then just before they uh, they come out, they actually will board about a half inch below the bark, pupate, and then they'll make their D-shaped hole. So this is diagnostic feeding over here. Uh, this is a, a close-up of vertical splitting. This is what you might see uh, on a tree that's that's if, where it's been fairly advanced. This tree, this is actually an early wound. This particular set, uh, you know, the first wounds uh, the trees can actually heal over. 
It's just that with repeated attacks, as the vascular system gets weaker and weaker, the tree is less and less able to defend itself against the further injury by this bore. Epicormic sprouting, I like to think that as the, the tree's last gasp. Uh, you know, I, I find even in some trees that I've gone back to 10 years after they've been treated, uh, they, uh, they just sort of, they look like uh, little chia pets, you know, they're <laughs> just covered with these, these little sprouts all, all over the edge over there. And, and I'm not sure about the structural soundness of those trees, but when the tree is like this, uh, there's just not much left of the tree really to save. And of course, this is the D-shaped holes on the bark. Okay, here's the beetle and there's a, a finger. Uh, if you have, if you see, you know, my, my colleague Deb McCulloch says, if uh, you're walking and you're inspecting a street tree or you're walking in the woods and you see lots of D-shaped holes close together on this big ash tree, keep walking away because that tree's probably totally dead and the chances of a branch falling on your head are are quite good. All right. So let's, I think, uh, you know, thinking of Jeff's comments over here, I think it's really important for me to focus on the emerald ash borer life cycle because the timing of application is going to be uh, critical. So uh, what happens is that the beetles right now, they are wintering as in a J-shaped larval stage underneath the bark. Uh, some will have pupated. And then uh, they'll, they'll, they make they come out of these D-shaped holes in in May or the spring, maybe maybe late May for you folks. I'm not sure when, but after they come out, they they have the adults have to feed on the leaves for about two to three weeks. Each beetle has to do that. So there's a period of about a month or six weeks where they're actually feed probably about a month or so where they're actually feeding on the leaves. So if you get that insecticide in the leaves at that time, you will kill the beetles before they lay their eggs, all right? So, you know, we try to tell people that, you know, wait until you start seeing the tree as just as soon as it starts, as the canopy is fully leafed out, or at least three quarters the way leafed out, you inject those trees at that point in time, and you, you can have sufficient translocation to get it up into the canopy. That's when you're gonna get your maximum protection. So I don't know what time of year that that is. I'm going to guess it's going to be sometime after Memorial Day for you. Uh, but, you know, you know when the trees are leafed out. You know that better than I do. So so the idea uh, is that, you know, so they, they'll mate, then they'll lay eggs, like I showed you that egg laying video, and then the eggs will hatch uh, in July, and then they'll make these, they have these nice flat larvae that look like little planarium, planaria, like planarian worms, and then they make this zigzag. Kind of, kind of a gallery. Uh, there is another beetle, uh, the red-headed ash borer, which is a longhorn beetle. That tends to make right angles, and uh, it, it, it really does not look at all at all like this. Okay. Any questions so far about the biology of this? Okay. Let's talk about time. All right. So this is, uh, you know, early on, you know, people will say, well, when should, you know, how long does this take to hurt, harm a forest? You know, what are we dealing with? And I just came up with this idea. I thought, well, maybe let's just uh, come up with a simple model to predict um, the rate at which the trees are going to be killed by emerald ash borer. And let's just say, let's, I wonder, you know, let's, let's the, I call this the doubling model, okay? So let's say in year one, this is and this is actual data from Fort Wayne. These are the number of ash trees that were removed out of 14,000 street trees in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay, so in 2006, they first detected emerald ash borer, and uh, they removed about 1% of their ash trees. Uh, the second year, they, they removed about 2%. And then year was about 4%, 8%. 16%. You see the pattern? It doubles every year. And this is really, this is like your sweet spot. You know, in the first couple of years, it's just detected. You have a lot of the, the trees are still, are still alive and, and, and left. But then once you start getting to 16%, it goes from 16 to 32. And then in the last three years, you lose all your ash trees. Okay. You go from 16% to 32% to 64 to 100% of your trees being lost. Now, my, my predictive model is a little bit 
lower than that, but you sort of get the gist. You know, it's an eight year sequence from the time you first start seeing a uh, uh, decline until uh, you lose just about all your trees. Now it might stretch out to 10, you know, but you know, the point being is that you got an early stage when you have the opportunity to, to save your forest, and then the rest of it becomes a salvage operation. And that's, that's really critical. And so this is actual real rate of tree removal from the city of Fort Wayne. Okay, the, my imaginary stuff is this black line, but the actual rate of decline from their records is this blue line. So this is real stuff. Okay, what do you do with dead trees? Now my friend uh, took this video of an ash tree he was pulling down. I want you to watch what happens when this tree hits the ground and listen. It's exploding. Look at that branch flying right over there, okay? So if you're gonna push down trees in the street, you're gonna have branches going through picture windows. It is just a nightmare, okay? The other thing is that if you're removing completely dead trees, they are incredibly brittle, they're very heavy and incredibly dangerous, okay? So those of you who have access to some of these uh, remote, uh, remote control uh, uh, grappling hooks and things along those lines, that's probably not a bad idea to use. Uh, it, they're very dangerous. So we really want to avoid having massive amounts of dead trees in Portland. Okay, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just not, you know, th these are things we really want, we really want to avoid. Okay, so, so what's the rate at which uh, uh, this happens here? So let's do a little bit of theory. So this is a graph, okay, and on the, what, the, the, the bigger the graph, the more of the thinning or the, the less of the tree that's left. I, I, I plot it with canopy thinning, which is the amount of the tree that's lost. Uh, the, uh, w w and, and that would be this, this, uh, this is that doubling model that I use, okay, uh, this green line. In order for that to happen, this, is, this black line is this theoretical emerald ash, emerald ash borer population. And it turns out that the peak of the emerald ash borer population is just when we hit that, we, we start crossing that 50% canopy thinning, 50% average trees, of the, more than half the trees are dead, basically. That's when we hit the, the peak abundance. And then as the abundance of, of uh, ash phloem declines, there's less food to feed on, the population starts to go down, but it, it persists for a long, a long period of time. So this is Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is Clinton Avenue. Uh, these trees have indeed been treated uh, with emamectin benzoate, and they are still alive today. All right. And this is a 16. This is it was found in 2006. So I think we're into like 17 years uh, since these things have been uh, protected. So you can keep your trees alive. You know, uh, the mayor really wanted those trees alive because they really like the LA and like, and like what it does for the, for the city. So if you want information about emerald ash borer control, this is the latest guide that Dan Herms, Deb McCulloch, Dave Smitley and I and Fred Miller and Whitney Cranshaw put together. Uh, it's available at emeraldashborer.info. Uh, this is our research-based summary. Uh, it came out in 2019, it's still fairly current. And uh, it, it will answer a lot of the questions that, that we had earlier on uh, about uh, whether or not you can use a bark spray. Uh, there are some uh, there are some products out there like a boxer, which is a uh, it's basically a hypodermic needle kind of a thing where you uh, where you take you you pull out a little plug and then you inject it and, and the bark actually separates. Uh, there's been several studies that have shown that just not enough product gets into the tree for that to actually work. All right. So uh, the the uh, the uh, methods that work are the actual injections of the of, of the benzoate. Something I know that uh, there are plugged systems like the ones that uh, Rainbow has. I mean that uh, Arborjet has, and there are plugless systems. Uh, like the one that Rainbow has, both of them work, okay? There's the 10% uh, solution, the R10, works just as well as the R4, okay, the 4% solution. 
Uh, so uh, the what I, what what's convenient about the ten percent solution is that that ten percent uh, uh, with the injecting device you only have to go around once because you can put enough product inside there. So it makes it a little bit easier and, and that that saves time. So let's go back to some fundamentals. Uh, because we're locked, we're talking about injections of systemic products. You, you need to have the trees to be watered. If a tree is in water deficit and it's not translocating very much, you're not going to get much product up into the canopy. So during drought, after you inject those trees, make sure that make sure it's watered. Uh, if you're in the middle of a drought, it would it, it wouldn't hurt at all to get some of those gator bags around some of those trees. You know what I mean by a gator bag? These are bags uh, that have little holes in the bottom. You put them around the tree, fill them up with water for a couple of days. Get that water, not get the soil nice and wet, so that the tree is actually translocating. And uh, normally that's not a problem in the spring, but with uh, the crazy weather we're having, you know, you just make sure that that the tree is translocating before you uh, do the injection. It'll make the injections go a lot faster too as well. Uh, imidacloprid is, a, is applied uh, by the soil. Uh, it does not kill the eggs and it kills the early instar larvae, but it's not very toxic. It's almost works as an anti feeding against the adults, but uh, it will it will it will kill them after after a while. Dinotefuran is much more toxic. OK, uh, but it, it too only kills the first uh, to uh, larval stages. Amamectin benzoate is highly toxic to the adults, highly toxic to the larvae, and in some studies that my colleague Deb McCulloch did, uh, where they injected uh, trees at one year, two year, and three year intervals, and then dissected these 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 forest trees, uh, they couldn't find any larvae in any of these, in any of their trees that 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 were injected even after after three years. So it works it works quite quite well. Azadiractin. Azadiractin is a uh, an extract of the neem tree and it can kill emerald dash borer. It kills the larvae quite well uh, and it reduces the fecundity of the adults. So in other words, what it does is it uh, the females don't produce as many eggs. So it works on two fronts. It's, it's not, but it has to be injected every single year in order for it to work. OK, so MMectin benzoate has to be injected once every three years. Dinotefuran and imidacloprid and azadiractin has to be injected annually. So uh, so if you have some folks who are concerned about using chemicals, so to speak, uh, you know, the uh, azadiractin can work, but it's only going to work if that tree is healthy when you get started. It takes it, it's really hard to to save a tree that has had some significant injury okay so uh don't so just you want to manage some expectations on on those sorts of things uh you know it's always important to have a conversation with your clients about you know what is the impact of the uh, small amount of insecticide you're putting inside that tree versus the impact of losing these very large trees and uh the ecosystems that they provide such as preventing water runoff and and the like Okay, now let's review how the insecticides kill emerald ash borer. Remember, we want to get that insecticide in as soon as possible so that, you know, so that when these beetles come out in May, the only leaves that they're going to feed on are poisoned. All right. Now, the good thing is that when they fly from another tree uh, to, so, so what happens is that they may leave, so you may treat one tree, and they can, uh, they'll feed on, they'll feed on the leaves from that tree, or they may have come from a tree that wasn't treated and, and feed on your tree. So your trees can actually help kill emerald ash borer once once they're once they're been, been treated. So, so what happens is that if let's say uh, the emerald ash borer is flying from a tree that that was not treated and it some for some reason missed the canopy and went straight to the trunk, that product that is inside the trunk will kill the larvae when the egg hatches, all right? So it kills the adults and it kills any beetles that came from other trees. The, the, the larvae resulting from eggs being laid from beetles that came from other trees. So it kills it in two, two different ways. All right, and then the poison cambium would, 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 would kill the larvae. So how long does it protect?
last, okay? Uh, this is a picture from Eagle Creek Park in Indianapolis, and my my graduate student uh, Don. Uh, what? So if, if this is if if you if you apply this with an ash borer and it's killing and it's killing the beetles and it kills. I'm sorry. If it's killing the beetles, and I I just lost you. I just got kicked out again. Um, yeah. Does it? Would this be something that you don't want to spray near a, uh, a hemlock tree when we're trying to put in a beetle that's trying to eat the adelgid? Do you know what I mean? So is that since it's killing all beetles, is oh, that something great. that you probably want to consider to keep it apart? You know what I mean? Uh, actually, no. Uh, I mean, it's a great question. I, I, I like this question because you know, you, you want to you certainly don't want to have uh, uh, the impact spreading. So. Because we are, we're, we're currently now we're going to have to treat both species. We're going to have to treat the emerald ash borer, but we're also we're introducing a beetle that's eating these adelgids in this hemlock. So are we basically shooting ourselves in the foot and wasting Absolutely. our time trying to, you know what I mean? So because oh, I know exactly have, what you mean. If we have this ash that we're treating while we're treating in the same proximity of these hemlocks with these Japanese beetles that we're bringing in, isn't it kind of like if it's going to kill all beetle species, we should, probably should kind of correlate to where we're going to treat things. And how long is this the residual effects? Is this going to last for a couple of years to kill off the beetles, or is this going to be something that's just initial? You know, so for so the following year we'll be able to treat the hemlocks and then alternate. You know what I'm saying? Because now we're because we got multiple species up here because we just kind of let everybody go rampant, bringing up wood, and they dump in a bunch of species out of here. So now we're going to slowly seeing what we got to deal with and how are we going to be able to kind of correlate which treatments are going to prevent which ones and which are going to act kind of shoot ourselves in the. Well, okay, that is a fantastic question. Uh, because uh, it says you're thinking a lot about the system. So uh, I want to move back, let's sort of back up a little bit and ask, and let's talk about what the concept of what, what risk is, all right? Risk is a function of hazard uh, it, and, and exposure, all right? So if, you, if you're using a toxicant like emamectin benzoate to kill beetles, the beetles that are exposed to the emamectin benzoate are going to be killed, all right? So if you are injecting a tree, you're not spraying the tree, you're injecting a tree, it's a subcutaneous injection, sub, sub bark injection, all right? Uh, you know, that material will stay inside the tree and it will go through the leaves and then as the leaves degrade, it will, it will go down. Now, uh, we, do, you know, uh, so there have been, uh, so the question is, how can that, you know, will that material, once it's inside the leaves container there, how can it get into the uh, picnic beetles, the nitidulids that are being rela released to control the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid? Uh, so first and foremost, the hemlock, the, those beetles are foraging, you know, where do those beetles forage? Are they foraging, do they forage on ash trees? Do you know if they do? I can uh, answer that. No, they will. They will be staying on their hemlock trees, so it should not be an issue. Right, because because the, the the hemlock woolly adelgid is this cottony mass of wax and honeydew and all That's this sort of stuff, early. and they're into it. And then there's some pollen that 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 that, that the hemlocks will shed early in the my, year. My question is the residual from the chemical. Spray so if we're going to be we're not treating spraying, wait, back up. You're not with, spraying with anything. Well, we're not spraying. No, no, I, I injecting totally. No, when we're treating, when we're treating our ash trees with these chemicals, and they actually go off and they leach through through the leaf into the environment. If we're treating, is there going to be a potential? I mean, because you got crawlers, and if the crawlers come in contact with this, and a beetle eats one of those crawlers, is it going to is it going to kill? Well, it turns out, you see it turns saying? out the, that the, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Come in contact with a leaf from an ash tree. That's that's my question is if we're, if if okay. say a crawler Why? comes in contact Richard, with, with the um, leaf I'm, that's on the ground, you know? Yeah, so the, yeah. the question is that why would a crawler come in how would the crawler get onto an ash leaf if falling it's on a hemlock tree, leaf? Falling off a hemlock tree. Don't you put nets on so we're going to actually have this, to sort of um, 
stop this discussion for now. That was my so, question. Yeah. Right now, so the, it is a an interesting question, but the the predator beetles aren't really feeding on crawlers on other trees, um, and it's something that if you want to talk about it more, I'd invite you to call our office, and we're we're happy to have that. But while we have Cliff here to talk about EAB, I really want to focus on that. So, but thank you for your question, Richard. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. So the question is, how long does the protection last? All right. And uh, so 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 here's. Uh, you know, people ask me if I did this in Photoshop. This is actually a parking lot I found in Bloomington, Indiana, where there were trees. Uh, the one on the left is 10% thin, can't be saved. This 30% thin, you know, can't be saved. And then uh, the one to the right, you know, 30% is, is on the margin. And then the one 50%, you know, can't can't be saved. Uh, so uh, that, that, that that's our target. So what I did was I wound up, I treated these trees once every three years with five mils of of of, of triage. Okay, not uh, not the G four, but the five percent uh, the the triage. This was, was done before G four was made. Okay, and uh, the average tree size was about forty inches in diameter. So these are monster trees. So my grad student here. Donnie, he's six foot tall, okay? So these are big trees, all right? The tree on the left was treated, the tree on the right wasn't treated, okay? For you visual learners, <laughs> okay? Now, here is a, this is exactly what, uh, what, what it looks like. So here we see, this is the canopy thinning, and <clears throat> the untreated ash trees are in the top line over here, all right? And you can see that, uh, they all, uh, we started when there was about maybe 10% canopy thinning. Not much happened, in this is in 2013, 2014, not much change, but boom, we had a drought and things just went nuts. And by 2017, we basically lost all the untreated trees. But trees that were treated in the springtime, which was say sometime in, uh, in May or, or June, uh, these trees uh, never had more than 20% canopy thinning, all right? Trees that were treated in the fall, which was in September, they, uh, you know, they had much more canopy thinning. And then uh, we treated them once in 2013 and again in 2016. And you see, once we treated them in 2016, we didn't treat them again, ever. So in terms of, so throughout the course of the entire 10 year study, we never had more than than this like 18% canopy thinning uh, until 2022. So we treated the last in 2016, you know, because the, the population of beetles is, is so it has been reduced because there's so much so much less food around for them to feed. We had we had one, two, three years where no treatment was needed. And you can actually treat again in, in the fourth year, but we're recommending waiting for three years just so you don't get this little bit of a bump. But even after five years, you know, there was still uh, some, uh, there was really no need, no need to treat because we a treatment would, would, would actually protect it. So uh, during the initial wave, once every three years is going to be really important and you might extend it a little bit further. So uh, this is, people want to know what happens if you stop treating and the, the thing is eventually you're going to have to treat it again, but maybe not as frequently. So let's do some back of the napkin economics here, all right? You got somebody who says, hey, I've got a 30-inch DBH ash tree. It's next to my house. You know, what should I do with it? Should I, should I treat it? Uh, and you say, well, you know, uh, to, to remove that tree, it's going to cost anywhere between $2,000 to $4,000, okay? Uh, depending on how far gone the tree is, how near it is to the house, all that sort of a thing. This is a conservative estimate. And to add a, to put in a new tree, stake it, mulch it, all that sort of stuff, another 400 bucks. So it's going to be at least $2,400. And if it's uh, really close to the house, maybe it's $4,400. So we got a ballpark estimate, $2,400 to $4,400. But, you know, the thing is, is that if you are, if it costs you $10 per inch to treat the tree, per diameter inch to treat a tree, that treatment's going to cost you $300 or about $100 a year. So in other words, uh, for the same money that it would take you to replace, 
to remove and replace that tree, you could have that tree be alive for 24 to 44 years by simply dividing the total cost, 2400 divided by $100 per year, you can have that tree for 24 years. So, uh, so when you're talking to clients, individual clients, you know, you're going to say, look, you, you, if you if you want me to remove this tree, we can, but it's going to cost you maybe three thousand dollars. But that could give you 30 years of having that tree alive next to your house. You know, so what do you want to do? You know, and then that's how you that's a good way to a good way to have the conversation. Any questions about that? I know this is something that this might be probably the most common way you'll be talking to your clients unless you're a municipal art person. Okay, I'll continue. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, we developed this website called the Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator. And if you, this QR code, if you take a picture of this, it's a link to an article that I uh, published in uh, India, in the uh, International Society of Arbor Culture, where we talked about uh, how we can use the cost calculator to, um, uh, to uh, uh, determine the economic value, whether or not it's worth treating a tree. And I'm going to go through this and go through the example like this. So imagine we have a forest with a, a city with 1600 ash trees. And the size class here in inches, this is the midpoint. So 1.5 would mean zero to three inches, four to five, 4.5 would be, you know, three to uh, uh, three to six, you know, and so on, um, all, uh, and so so forth, corresponding to these DBHs we have over here. Uh, and this is this is the size. We have about twenty five thousand total DBH inches in in the forest. Uh, we ha this is the cost based on Indianapolis prices about maybe fifteen years ago. And uh, because this is going to be an in house treatment, we're just talking about just for the product cost about $5 per inch DBH, and we would treat every three years through year 10, and then after year 10, every five years. And we assume that the treatment saved 98% of the trees and the annual mortality of the replaced or saved trees is 2%. The tree size we're putting in there is a two inch tree and it costs $400 to purchase, plant, and stake it. I wanna compare three strategies. One, let's uh, replace the ash as they die. All right. In other words, like when an ash tree has lost more than 30% of a canopy, take it out. We can then proactively replace ash trees by just just doing just getting rid of all of them over seven years so you can even out some of the costs. Or we can just decide just to save the larger ash trees and then replace the smaller ash trees. All right. This is a three different scenarios that we're going to compare. The Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator is available at eabindiana.info, and it allows you to basically stage your infestation. So uh, what we recommend that you do is you look at your forest and say, well, what percentage of the trees have lost more than 30% of their canopy? You know, if it's 1% or less, you're, you're, you're still early in the game. Uh, if, it, if it's a 16%, you're in about year five with EAB, and uh, you only got a few more years before the rest of them all go down, and then we'd call that a little bit late. So I'm going to make some comparisons between an early response and a late response. So I'll just go back, make sure that you know, this software allows you to stage your 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 uh, scenario. So uh, so the top graph represents the annual costs of removal and replacement and treatment. Uh, over a 25 year period if you got started early. All right, so the black line refers to removing the trees as they die. And you note that in the last three years, you just get hammered with costs. I mean, that last year, you're upwards of a half a million dollars of an annual cost to remove, it, remove that. So, you know, most cities have a hard time dealing with spikes like that. Okay, so if you just wanted to remove the trees and even out your costs, you could just cut it, uh, you just would remove a certain amount every single year and you'd, your costs would be a little more even. 
then if you're treating every three years, you know, every third year you'd you'd have to you'd be removing some trees, the smaller trees, and then you'd be but you'd be treating the rest, and then finally, you know, it, you'd be treating once every every five years towards the end. Okay, so you see that if we wait a little bit later on, if we wait till five years, you know, uh, the removal curve is somewhat compressed. So instead of having eight years to get all this stuff done, we have about four years to get all this stuff done. All right. And because the removal costs are compressed, they're higher. So instead of going over half a million dollars, we're now almost up to $700,000 for the peak. All right. So, uh, but, but if we are replacing just the big tree, the, just the small trees and saving the big trees, we have a lot uh, lower, lower costs cumulatively, which means like over time, how much costs are we accumulating? Uh, we see a very interesting picture. If we start in year, go back, start in year one, we notice that, you know, in over the eight years, it costs about a million dollars or so, uh, $1.1 million to remove and replace all, all, all your trees, whether you're removing it uh, as they die or you're removing it over time. But uh, if you are saving your large trees, even after 25 years, you're about $400,000 ahead of the game. You're about, say, about, about two $300,000 ahead of the game after 25 years, okay? So it makes more sense if you start early. If you start a little bit later, okay, the removal costs are gonna be higher because you've lost more of your trees, but you're still gonna be ahead of the game, all right? What about the rental that benefits? Well, you know, this is kind of a kind of a silly graph, but let's face it. If you remove a lot of trees and uh, you're replacing these trees as you're removing them, uh, your tree is going to be your forest is going to be smaller than if you kept the large trees alive. All right. Any questions here at this point? So the the critical point. Hey, yeah, sure. Yes. I'm just going to. I'll point out it's 1130. Yep. I'm good. I got I, I don't have to get out of here till till 12. Uh, I, I, so I, I can. I'm OK if you're OK. Is, that, is this OK with you guys? OK, good. Um, all right. So uh, so an early start is going to be critical for success now. Can you reduce the labor with these with half the injection holes? A couple of years ago, Brant had this system that was out here where you would just uh, these were prepackaged little deals, and you could just break this. You would break a, a package deal, and you would you'd only have like you know four holes per tree. And we tried this out, and we we did it. We actually installed this uh, when the beetles were flying, because you can actually see these beetles. They were actually I think they were like uh, suicide beetles. <laughs> You know, flying themselves right, 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 right onto the bags of insecticide over here, but they were out and about, and we compared the uh, Arborjet uh, product with the, with uh, the old, uh, with uh, the uh, uh, the on the, with the Q Connect system from Rainbow, and uh, we found that uh, all that that all three products systems worked pretty well for two years, but it was in that third year that reducing those holes uh, just didn't work. So pretty much you're only going to get two years worth of control if you're reducing uh, the amount of, of, of holes that you're using. So what you're saving in labor early on, you're going to be paying for in removal costs. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, these are the new systems, uh, you know, uh, QuickJet Air, you know, Arborjet, Rainbow, all these companies are they're 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 trying really hard to reduce the costs. I mean, they've got really good people in both those companies. Uh, they're trying really hard to deliver really good products. But the philosophy here is uh, they want to reduce the cost of, of of injecting these things and making it more dependable, so that you can reliably protect your trees. This uh, ten percent solution with a quick jet air uh, works really nice because you only have to go around once with this with this injection device. And uh, that that that's that's a, a lot faster than waiting for the translocation to take this to take the product up. And because you're using a much more concentrated solution, uh, it takes less time for the, for the material to be translocated up into into the canopy. It's a, it's a small smaller job. Any questions up to now? 
Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to just show you. Uh, we did this. This is something called Urban Slam, which slow dash mortality, and it kind of works like this. You treat 20% of the canopy each year with a two-year insecticide, so that 40% of the canopy is full of poison leaves. And the what happens is that uh, beetles that have to feed to mature their eggs will feed on the leaves and die before they lay eggs. And then that will slow up the rate of population decline uh, in the untreated trees. And there could be actually uh, a shadow effect. In other words, like if you have if you have enough trees that are treated, uh, there'll be so much toxic canopy that uh, it'll actually protect trees that are nearby. So we did this on three college campuses and we evaluated trees. Uh, we treated 40% of the trees. We evaluated trees for six years or until most of the trees died. And this is one of the campuses in Terre Haute. And uh, the untreated trees are, are white circles. The treated trees are, are, are black circles. And this is a really heavily concentrated area. It's a nice parking lot. And here the trees were sort of scattered a little bit more throughout. All right. And uh, what we found was that uh, the healthier the forest, uh, the better shot we had of keeping the trees alive. OK, that I think we pretty much covered that one already. Uh, and uh, the more, uh, you know, so if, if you had more, if you had very few moribund trees, trees that were, uh, uh, that were filled with ML ash you're going to have a, a, a better shot of, of protecting than if you have, have a lot more of them. Also, white ash tends to do a lot better than green ash. White ash dies more slowly than green ash, so you have a little more time. And then uh, the proximity helps so that in that area, that little parking lot area where you have a lot of the trees near each other, the trees that where the canopies are almost touching have a better shot of this uh, shadow effect. And so here we see that, you know, the, the, this gray area represents the area where the ash trees were, the untreated ash trees were dying. Whereas here, most of these trees where we treated, even the ones that, you know, especially I remember on this one street, we had every other street, every other tree was, was an ash tree and the canopies were touching. And I couldn't tell which trees were treated and which trees weren't treated if I didn't have my maps. So that, so that, that, that seems, seemed to work pretty well. Um, so um, uh, at Indiana State University, this is kind of interesting. Uh, this bark, this lot, this is, we started in 2013, we continued it to 2017. These are the trees that were treated with triage, okay? And uh, we only lost about 20% of the trees that were treated, okay? So we had a fairly decent rate of success. The trees which were not treated, we lost 45% of those. And all the untreated trees, I mean, and, and, uh, and had we not used any insecticide, all the trees would have been dead by 2016. So, you know, using this, um, you know, treating, you know, if, if you have, you know, uh, if, if, if you treat a lot of trees, you know, uh, and you miss a few, you might get some of this uh, shadow effect. In Bloomington, we started it later on, where uh, the, uh, we started out with about 60% of the, of, the, of the trees were too, were too far gone to be treated. And the, uh, we did, we were able to save uh, quite a few of the trees. You know, we only lost about 20%, just like on the other place. Most of the trees we treated were saved uh, from the treatments. But, you know, uh, the, uh, the slam of the, the shadow effect wasn't quite as effective. And, you know, we, uh, but, you know, the things that, the point of this slide is no matter how late you start, you can still save a good part of your trees. But, you know, the earlier you start, the more trees you're going to be able to save. Now, um, and here's an example of um, tree species. On the left, we see white ash, okay? Uh, and uh, these are the trees that were, that were uh, the, uh, predicted in the absence of treatment. Uh, these trees were, so, there's like, so these trees here were, 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 were predicted uh, to be lost, but these are the actual trees that, could, uh, that, that, were, that were not treated and lost. But you notice that these, this line here, the treated trees, these trees here were actually, uh, we lost virtually none, none of the white ash trees, 
but the green ash trees we seem to lose more. So the green ash trees, I think it was because they were more heavily damaged than we thought when we first started. We tended to lose more of them. They did not respond as well as well to the treatment. So. Okay, um, moving on along here. So. Uh, so basically, this is just sort of uh, repeats all this stuff. So at this point, you know, I like to acknowledge this was done by a small army of people and colleagues uh, around the country, and uh, this is that uh, list of videos that I, I, I thought you might find interesting. So with that, I'm opened up to any questions you might have. And again, I would ask folks, um, you can articulate your questions in the chat, or if um, there's a flood of questions here, it would be really helpful for us um, meeting moderators if you would use the raise hand function that's up at the top of your, your screen um, so oh, we uh, can call on you. Okay, there's a guy named Q Porter said, is there any collateral damage to birds eating boars which have ingested the insecticide? It's a great question. Uh, well, it, it turns out that uh, the beetles die quickly just after a few bites when they're feeding on the leaves. So I don't think that the birds are going to be attacking, are going to be eating dead, dried up beetles. All right. And uh, there are so few larvae inside the treated trees, there's really nothing for them to feed on. So they're not even going to be able to find them underneath there because there's really nothing to find on those treated trees. Cliff, I had a question um, going back to the video that you showed of the tree being felled. Do you yeah. know how long that tree had been dead or had been infected by EIB? I do know that they dry out really. I don't I don't know. I, I, I really don't know how long it is. I think it, it might have been dead it, 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 because it was completely dead. It was probably attacked about five years earlier. OK. And and so there was a, a Arnon, I guess a fellow in a, in Ohio has done uh, Arnon Prasad has done some work looking at the mechanical integrity of of the trees, and in that review article, I guess uh, for the Journal of IPM, I, I, I cite that one there. And basically, he found that once you lose thirty percent of your canopy, the tree has lost a lot of its structure, its structural integrity. Okay, so you want to think about ash trees as um, a ring porous species, meaning they have only one ring of functional xylem around the trunk. Unlike maple trees or elm trees, elms and maples are diffuse porous, so there are several rings of actively conducting xylem. So we have a much thicker area of sapwood, okay, in, in, in a maple. Or an, or, or an elm tree, but an ash tree, it's just really very thin. So because there's, once you etch that single layer of functional xylem, it dries out really fast and it's heavy. Now, one of the things that drives me, that, that, that just to, to stress this point. So you saw that picture of me uh, standing, my graduate student standing next to those big trees. I mean, these were monster trees. These are big white ash. They might've been 150 years old. And it was, you know, and uh, I would be walking through to do the evaluations and I would see, you know, typically you know, when an ash tree breaks, it doesn't break, doesn't crumble from the top. You'll have limbs about the size of your thigh, okay, you know, just snap in half about 30 feet above the ground. That's kind of where they break. And I saw, you know, logs that were just sunk in about a foot into the ground from the top of the canopy. OK, so I told my crew, we do not go in that forest on a windy day. You know, we're just not going to do that because you can wear you can wear a hard hat and, you know, it's not going to it's not going to save you from getting your neck broken. So, uh, yeah, so they're 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 they they die very fast. So and that and, and there've been a lot of people. I mean, I've been called in for, uh, you know, People try to bring me in to talk about uh, for wrongful death suits. I mean, people have died from dying ash trees. Um, ash trees have fallen on power lines, started fires, causing house fires. This is a, this is a real urban catastrophe. So uh, the sooner you get 
so 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 as as a as a city manager, you got to ask yourself what what fight do you want to fight? Do you want to fight keeping the trees alive and managing your budget over you know and being able to to manage it better by keeping as many trees as alive and then slowly phasing out the ash trees over time as you can afford it? Or do you want to be dealing with a standing forest of dead ash trees with public health being put at risk by having trees being able to fall down all over the place? And these are conversations that every community needs to have, and they should have nice, honest discussions about what's going to happen. But, but if uh, I, you know, uh, the reason I included that video is I wanted you to see what happens when a tree falls down. It's, it's, incredibly scary. I know you all work with trees and just the thought of that, I mean, that's got to be really scary just to see that, to think that that could happen. And what, the other thing that happens is that if you're just cutting a tree down with a chainsaw, the vibrations from that chainsaw can cause the limb to break. I was talking to my my nephew who lived up in Fort Wayne. He was working with his with his father-in-law. You know, he says, oh, I don't care, Cliff. You don't safety schmafe. You don't worry about that stuff. And he said, he said, well, I was doing this thing and all of a sudden this branch fell down and, and, you know, it missed us. We didn't tell our wives about it, but it missed us, you know. And so, so, but this stuff is really, it's just real. It's really dangerous. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's something you really have to be treated with respect. Thank you, Cliff. I'm not seeing uh, any more questions uh, lots of commentary in the the um chat but no more questions i would encourage folks um if you do have additional questions you can put them in the chat and we can forward those to cliff to answer afterwards but i want to thank you tremendously for your your time here today cliff i've been getting email messages of, about um what a, a um a gem you are and how appreciative our audience is of of your time here to talk to us today um all of these points are really really important and well received by our municipal tree managers here in maine so thank you and, and thank you for the work that you've done to to make this uh infestation a little bit easier for those of us that are are, are coming up um and picking up the rear with the ab well, um a little bit easier to deal with well just i want to shout out uh one of the people who used to work with me, uh, Elizabeth Barnes, is now in Massachusetts, Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, and she's been uh, she's been working, taking over there. So she's she's local. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, all right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks so much. I want to remind folks too, we do still have a few more minutes here and we're going to try to get to, through the rest of the agenda. Um, we do have that those pesticide credits um, and forester credits. And if you want those pesticide credits, you want to take that quiz, uh, which Amy has posted several times in to the chat. Um, Allison's posted several uh, other resources, including that EAB cost ca calculator, which also comes out of uh, Cliff Shop over at Purdue, um, which is a great resource for um, tree managers to uh, assessed uh, management costs for EAB. So <laughs> we're going to head on in our agenda to talk about a main perspective of working with cities and towns. We have Tom Ford from Davy Tree Expert Company. Tom is a certified main landscape and utility arborist as well as pesticide applicator. He serves on the board of directors for the Maine Arborist Association. Um, he started with Davy Tree in 1995, um, went on to work with Maine um, at Lucas Tree Expert Company um, and uh, Arbor Tree Care and Landscape. And now he's back with Davey. He has his degree in horticulture and arbor culture from UNH, and he is a graduate of the Davey Tree Institute of Tree Science. So welcome, Tom. Um, he is going to again talk about uh, experiences working with main, main municipalities in uh, managing ash trees for EAB. So thank you, Tom. Oh, thank you, Jen. Um, yeah, um, I guess a couple notes I wanted to, I, I can talk about our local um, um, experience uh, so far. Um, it, you know, there's definitely s some EAB in different areas, um, spotty, but um, through the, I would say the part, it seems to be a, it, it, it seems to be an anomaly to me, but maybe that's how it works. Um, but um, there's a corridor from probably about Gorham right through the center of um, Portland up to the east end where we've seen the most damage. Um, 
And I think Jeff Tarling and and some of the um, um, Andy Gagnon and and now uh, Mark Ryland can probably uh, talk to that a little bit if they need to. But um, yeah, so um, we have done we have tried to do we we did a lot of injections last this past year um, uh, with the city and obviously uh, the state has. Uh, um, kind of helped with that. Um, we've used uh, two different, um, a macro and a micro um, injection system, and we're just hoping to wait on, uh, we've used the two-year rate, and we're hoping to wait on results and, and see how that works. Um, some of the trees, like, you know, we, like uh, Cliff talked about, is, you know, getting up into the 30% decline range, we're not sure if that's going to work, but we wanted to give it a shot, um, try to save as many trees as we could. Um, I will say, um, I guess one point before I forget, um, and Cliff mentioned on our Persaud, he's one of our um, uh, directors um, in PHC, um, and tree structure is imperatively important um, for us as arborists. Um, we do not climb. We do not climb dead ash trees anymore. It's absolutely imperative that everybody heeds that warning. Um, like Cliff said, it, you know, these trees are, they turn to dust immediately and they're not structurally, um, not structurally safe to climb. Um, so implements, equipment is uh, extremely important. Um, like Jeff, uh, and I'll just back up a little bit, like Jeff Gillis talked about, um, the challenge is uptake. Like I said, the macro versus the micro. I, um, we've we've done both, and we want to kind of see the results from that. Um, and the city of Portland and their team, um, uh, I think it's Liz, uh, her GIS mapping um, has helped us immensely, just getting around and finding all the trees throughout the city. I mean, obviously the city is, <laughs> it's, um, but, um, we also had to take down some trees um, for one of the schools in Portland. And I believe we did that in March. And I just wanted to make this point and put it out there. Um, those trees were dead. They were pretty small, probably six inch trees. Um, but I took a draw knife um, and that was, I, I believe it was in March, maybe early April. But um, I took a draw knife and I peeled the bark back I wish I I should have downloaded some photos of it, but um, the larva were active during that time and the temperatures were pretty cold. So I know we talk about life cycles, but um, that was very surprising to me. So I thought that was something I'd, I'd like to mention. Um, I don't know. Um, I know one of our tech advisors, uh, David Olson, I think is online. I don't know if he's willing to chime in he's um done uh extensive following of eab i guess all the way from beyond the midwest all the way to the east coast so um yeah david if you're available and you have any uh information uh feel free to feel free to chime in um yeah so um we did i think injected over over a hundred trees um, in the city of Portland um, last year. So we're gonna hopefully, like I said, look around and and um, see what the results are. Um, we've treated trees that were healthy as a preventative. We've also treated trees that were probably questionably in the 30% decline range. So um, we don't know that data yet, but I know um, like I think like Cliff talked about earlier that um, depends on you know depends on uh, weather and uptake and all of that so um, 
Yeah, but I mean the help with uh, the city and in the state trying to uh, um, get ahead of the game as much as we can. I mean, it's been, yeah, it's uh, we're like I said, we're kind of new to this, but there's a lot of information around from um, you know other parts of the country. Um, so yeah, we're hoping to get ahead of it and hopefully we can uh, get a grasp on saving a lot of trees. So, yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, with the city of Portland and, and their treatment of 100 trees, were you involved as a company in helping the city managers, helping Alex and, and Mark as he came on board, um, or Jeff, with convincing the public that that was going to be the best choice for the city trees and and also con to convince city leaders that that was going to be the most cost effective way to um, deal yeah. with the trees? Yeah, um, well, I mean, we, we've also put out with all to, to our current clients, we've put out memos, you know, and, and emails um, trying to give them, you know, on a um, on a basis that, you know, preventative is the best way to go. Um, with the city, yes, um, we targeted, like I said, um, we targeted the trees that we thought were, were the most, uh, effective, um, treatments to try to save those trees. We did, like I said, we did try a few trees that were probably in the 30% decline, but we want to get that data and see if we are able to, we're able to save those trees. Um, and we were using a two year treatment, which was G4. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, fingers crossed that we, you know, um, did due diligence on uh, on the best trees, but um, there were a few trees that we tried and hopefully we'll see what the results are on those. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, the city really, I mean, the, the city crew really did a, a good job of identifying the trees that, you know, that they wanted to, save and preserve and like i said we we threw a couple of we threw a couple of um pieces at the wall to see if they would stick you know if you will but yeah so um i don't know we'll see um but i think uh due diligence of preventative maintenance um again um is going to be an important part going forward for sure Thanks, Tom. Any questions for Tom? I realize we're we're coming right up on the noon hour, and we do still want to try to get um, Gary and Mike in here um, uh, to provide a, a main update. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, Xavier, you have your hand raised. Um, you feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you're muted, Xavier. I can try to unmute you. Amy, can you help out? I I don't think I can unmute somebody. Yeah, I I'm not able to either. Xavier, are you able to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi. Oh, there you. I heard you, but then you went back muted. seem to be there getting remuted. Okay. There you go. I've got, I've got some customers with borderline trees that have decided to treat them after I've told them, you know, given the, the scope. And yeah, we do get control on the stuff that's still alive. When would you prune off the stuff that's already dead? Would you wait and see um, if they're going to be okay the next year, at least the live stuff, or would you prune it off right away? Tom, you want to go ahead and take that one? I think um, uh, um, if the trees have been treated, I would wait until spring to see what comes back. Because like Cliff was talking about earlier, that, you know, some of the dead limbs or a percentage of the tree that's already dead is not going to come back. So, I, I mean, if they, if they have been treated, I would wait until spring and see what the leaf out brings before, 
you know, before you get into, you know, because you may, may in the spring, you may have to determine that tree has to be removed. Um, right. So, I, I mean, that would be like kind of a cost effective, cost effective thing for your clients um, to make a decision or for let you to make a decision in the springtime. That's kind of how I go about it. I, did, I don't want to, I don't want to go in and prune something out and charge them money for something that's going to be need to be removed in the spring. You know, I mean, that's kind of my my forte on it. But yeah. Agreed. Oh, Dan, you're muted. Of course I am. Um, anybody who wants to stay on and get a, a quick update from Gary Fish, state horticulturist with the DACF um, uh, Division of Plant Industry and um, Mike Parisio, entomologist with the Maine Forest Service, I'm going to put you guys on. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, I will make it short and sweet. Um, yeah, Gary, I'm not sure what you're going to cover. Um, if I have time, I'll just share some maps quick. So, uh, yeah, one thing I just uh, wanted to go over with folks, we're kind of wrapping up our uh, Emerald Ash Borer monitoring season statewide. So we have a whole variety of uh, activities going on. So just to report on that, let me share some maps. Do -do -do. All right, can folks see my screen? Yes. Okay, so this is basically what our statewide monitoring activities look like for 2023. So the majority of this monitoring is purple prism traps represented by those little purple um, points there. So we typically run about 200 traps each year. So we're done with those for the year. We've checked them all. So none of our traps were positive this year, again, um, but a good early detection tool. Um, we did have some other cooperators that were using purple prism traps in uh, known infested areas just to kind of confirm some presence. So some of those actually did turn up the EAB. So nice to see that the uh, the traps and concept do work. Um, so yeah, we'll continue with that program in future years. Um, probably the, the second biggest program we have is the Girdle Trap Tree Network. So you can see those with those green points. So about 25 in northern Maine, 25 in southern and central Maine. So we're done processing those. Uh, so in northern Maine, we've seen a little bit of local spread, nothing surprising. Uh, we had two positive girdle trap trees, um, but again, nothing out of the ordinary or surprising, just some local spread. And then uh, we didn't have any surprise in southern or central Maine either. Um, but we did have a couple positive trees at sites where we're looking to establish biological control uh, next year. So uh, we got positives where we were actually hoping for positives because once we know we have EAB in a suitable stand, we can go ahead and apply for uh, biological control permissions and hopefully get those things launched. So um, yeah, there'll be, uh, you know, we'll continue with similar programs like these in the upcoming years. Um, and then, yeah, we talked a lot about tree removals today, um, or uh, yeah, well, all sorts of, of tree management activities. So while we hope we can save as many uh, ash trees as possible with all these, uh, you know, developed uh, insecticide treatment options, stuff like that, we are well aware we'll be dealing with a lot of uh, removals and stuff. So while we're figuring out what to do on the front side of things, it's also very important to be thinking about the back side of things, and that involves you know, what we're doing with all these tree wastes um, from infested trees and stuff like that that gets removed. So we certainly don't want to be putting in a lot of effort uh, to doing a good job on the front end and then moving around EAB and, uh, you know, municipal removal waste and stuff like that to places where we shouldn't. So um, I guess that's a segue into uh, some revisions to quarantine zone. So uh, you have all that have attended these meetings in the past, you know, have have known that this process of revision was in the past or in the process. So um, we finally gotten around to uh, getting all these things passed um, on the books and stuff. So this is what the new Emerald Ash Borer 
regulated area looks like um, statewide on the left there. So um, some minor changes to the northern main area that I'll go over on the next slide. But for the time being, you can see that there's been a uh, an expansion of the quarantine zone in southern Maine. So those of you that are familiar with the emergency order area map um, that we have, you know, had in place while we were doing all these changes, uh, this new quarantine zone has actually shrunk a little bit. So uh, it's a little bit further south. Um, than the emergency order in areas like Franklin and Somerset counties uh, where that quarantine zone dips down there. But if you pay attention to the map on the right, um, one thing that's really important to point out, not all of the quarantine zone is infested. So uh, the quarantine zone is put in place to provide a buffer zone of non-infested areas to, uh, you know, hopefully prevent the AB from moving outside of. But if you take a look at those red and orange um, colors on the right hand map so basically every time we have a positive point we put a three mile uh buffer zone in red around it so because how how, how difficult emerald ash borer is to detect um you know we generally consider if we know we have a positive point you know a tree or a cluster of trees we give it a three mile zone around it and there's a very good chance that eab is present in that area um or it will be based on you know an assumed uh dispersal of a mile or two a year naturally so uh beyond that you know the orange color that's a 10 mile buffer um around a positive point so while we haven't found eab in those areas there's you know also a possibility that there are eab populations at very low levels in those areas too so uh from a, a management treatment standpoint you know those are the zones to be uh to be paying attention to and uh, starting your management if you're in those uh those reds and oranges depending on how uh proactive you want to be. So um, that's what Southern Maine looks like. These maps are, are just getting uploaded. Um, there was a link put in the chat box to our quarantine page, so you can review these more carefully. But again, just be, be mindful, you know, if you're working in some of these satellite infestations, so to speak, and you have to transport, you know, removed waste, you know, depending on where your facility is or where it can be disposed of, you know, we like stuff to be, you know, left in place or, you know, chipped and stuff like that. But um, that should be part of everybody's plan. So um, that's Southern Maine. Um, not much change in Northern Maine. We added a couple towns here just in response to an old Fort Kent uh, find from, from last year. So that's just been kind of maintaining that, that buffer zone. So if anybody's tuning in from Northern Maine, not much, uh, not much change up there. And those two towns were previously in the emergency order area. So um, a lot of the theme has been EAB today, but we have uh, three quarantine revisions going on simultaneously. So uh, we did talk a little bit about hemlock uh, woolly adelgia today. So be aware too that that, uh, that quarantine zone has expanded quite a ways inland uh, based on a bunch of detections right on the previous um, borderline of the former quarantine zone and a detection in Gardner that was actually outside of that quarantine zone. So uh, yeah, be aware that um, we have expanded the hemlock woolly adelgid quarantine zone as well. Um, and then finally, We've also expanded European large canker for any folks turning in from uh, down east and eastern Maine. Um, so we've connected some of the the zones here. So this is what that new uh, new zone looks like. And this map also points out that you know there are regulations in place in Canada right across the border. So there are implications for uh, for back and forth movement there. So and then here's just a regional map. So again, um, primarily something going on in Canada, but it is present in Maine. So we are kind of share this uh, this regulated area. So um, like I said, a lot of information there on these maps to digest, but they are uh, up on our website now. So we'll throw another link into the um, the, cha uh, the the chat box there so folks can peruse these and the complete, uh, complete rules in text uh, along with town lists and stuff is all there so you can verify your towns and I'll just point out that we have now have EAB in 13 counties in Maine, but still a uh, substantial amount of uh, ash um, outside of those regulated zones. So that's what I have for my quick update. So any questions or I'll hand it off to Gary if he has anything to add. Well, I can share what I have. It's going to be a little bit duplicative, but 
it'll help with their quiz. So if you can stop sharing. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Mike. Can you stop sharing your screen? All right, you should be able to see mine now. Yep. Okay. So I'm the state horticulturist and work with the Forest Service on the quarantines and help to um, adopt those quarantines, which just were recently adopted. And as Mike showed, you know, here is the, the full Emerald Ash Borer quarantine. It was adopted on November 26. So now it's been expanded in the north and the south. Uh, it did change one thing in terms of uh, green lumber. Used to be all green lumber was uh, regulated, and now it's only green lumber with bark, live edge, or wane. So that has been reduced to some degree. And of course, it also includes all hardwood firewood and includes any ash, live ash, or you know anything that you would potentially be planting, which we hope nobody's doing anymore anyways. And there are 13 counties now that have towns that are in the, the quarantine area. And as Mike mentioned, there are two new townships that were added in Northern Maine, T16R8 and T16R9. And that was in response to some fines that were more than a year ago. And many new towns were added in the south as we've seen the expansion. And, you know, basically you've got 22 towns in southern Franklin County, all but seven northern towns in Oxford, 31 towns in southern Penobscot County. And there's a few in um, Piscataquis County as well. And um, just as a reminder, we do have an exterior quarantine as well. So this covers outside of Maine. So all the areas that are uh, have new fines are being mapped by the Forest Service in, in the United States and by CFIA in Canada. So we um, include that in our quarantine. So they, they're not allowed to ship materials into Maine without some sort of a compliance agreement or some other arrangement. And just as a reminder, um, you know, we do have this uh, hemlock woolly adelgid quarantine that's been expanded. It was adopted November 1st, along with the, the one that was mentioned earlier with the European larch canker. I only have the map for the hemlock woolly adelgid here. There were a number of new detections in 22, 23. It's expanding east and inland, maybe in relation to climate change. And now there are 12 counties that are in the quarantine area. And just as a reminder, you know, it's not good to move firewood inside the state of Maine or um, it's illegal to bring it into Maine from outside of Maine. So, you know, we do have these signs that are around at major crossings. We have the one like the one in the lower right hand corner and we have the one that's in the upper right hand corner at a number of the places that you might stop along the highways. Just as a reminder, because now that we have it in southern Maine, where a lot of people are traveling up north, uh, we want to make sure that people are not bringing firewood up to camp and uh, spreading this pest uh, that much faster. You know, seeing it spread from Cumberland County all the way to Penobscot County in a year, it's obviously not doing it on its own. It's us that are moving it around, so we need to be really vigilant and careful about that and letting us know if you you know find people that are moving stuff that you're concerned about so that it can be attended to. And with that, that's all I have. So thanks for giving me a few minutes. Gary, I think this is a great question for you from Eric, um, given what you just uh, spoke about. Given the effectiveness of pesticides discussed this morning, could a firewall of treatment be made around the known infested areas? Wouldn't this substantially slow the spread? Boy, that would be just wonderful if we could do something like that, wouldn't it? But uh, I, I don't think that that would be accepted by the public, first of all. And second of all, I'm I'm not sure that there's the funding or the will out there to, to do something like that. Um, it would have been wonderful if we could have put up a wall before it even got to Maine. But unfortunately, that's just not something that, um, you know, can be done. I know that 
They are doing um, some targeted treatments like that in some areas in New Hampshire where they're trying to preserve some of the seed trees, especially for brown and black ash. So they're trying to treat in a certain way to either push or pull the emerald ash borer away from those seed trees that they're trying to to maintain. And, you know, that that kind of treatment, I think, could potentially help in some areas, but there's definitely not the will to do something like this, unfortunately. Yeah, I would add, <clears throat> Eric, um, that 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 um, is also based on the assumption that we know where EAB is, which right. I think we've we've shown yeah. pretty well that um, humans aren't the best at detecting it. Um, any other questions for for Mike and for Gary um, before we we sign off? I'll maybe just mention that that people in the early years of uh, VAB did try that firewall method, and it has never been successful, um, <laughs> even, even in really early infestations. Yeah, yeah, it worked pretty well for for Asian longhorn beetle, really. Um, if you think of uh, the eradication of all of the potential host trees for Asian longhorn beetle, but because EAB was so largely widespread, um, even initially, once we found out what it was, it, it didn't work. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there. Um, again, thank you for taking the time. Uh, for those of you looking for pesticide credits, you want to make sure you take that quiz before midnight tomorrow. And if you, again, are not identifiable by your, um, your screen name here during the Teams program, you want to make sure that you email that to amy at foresthealth.maine.gov. Um, and uh, I believe we'll be doing another one of these in March, but keep your eyes on the lookout in our various different newsletters that come out from the Maine Forest Service and, and our forest health updates for when the next um, municipal update will be. Um, and also I should mention, um, for those of you interested in funding for treatment uh, and management of, of ash trees with EAB. Uh, Project Canopy will be releasing very soon uh, our, our annual Canopy grants, as well as some additional funding uh, resources that will be available to municipalities. So for those of you that are working with municipalities, you want to make sure that you um, make them aware of those, those um, uh, grants that are available, um, we would very much like to help towns with with the management of their ash trees. So, um, Allison, Gary, and others on the call, if you have any additional things you want to say, um, please I pipe have, in now. Otherwise, thank you. Amy. I would like to add, uh, I have somebody who took the pesticide credit who did not leave his name or email address. And so, can I I'll just suggest you take it again and leave those. I do not share the email address with anybody, um, but the the quiz does come through anonymous, so I don't know who you are, who has done this. Okay, so hopefully that person is still on and 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 got that message. Um. Oh, yeah. Also, we'll be we did record this, and we will share that recording um, with everybody who participated after the fact. So, thanks again, folks. Have a great day.